99% of all the internet traffic, and most probably the video you're watching now, has traveled over an undersea cable somewhere along the route. It's estimated that the finance sector alone sends some $10 trillion per day of financial transactions over these cables. And as a whole, there are thousands of petabytes of data flowing through them on a daily basis. But if you thought that security was just about preventing them from being cut, then you'd be wrong. As cable tapping to gain access to the vast amounts of data that travels through these cables also goes on, and with virtually nothing in the way of oversight, because it's being done in the name of national security. And it's not just data. Countries like China, the United Kingdom, Germany and Denmark are setting up large offshore wind farms to generate electricity on a very large scale, not only to go green, but to have a reliable source of energy unaffected by oil and gas prices and all the uncertainty that this entails in today's fractured world. And all of these need to be connected via undersea cables. Together, these unseen cables have a huge strategic and economic importance. But how safe are they from both damage and wiretapping from intelligence agencies, rogue states, bad actors, and just natural phenomena? Now, we might think that undersea cables are a recent development, and therefore sabotage of them is an equally modern thing. But the first undersea telegraph cables became operational in 1850 between England and France and the first transatlantic cable between Newfoundland and Ireland in 1858. That first cable failed due to poor insulation, but by 1866, the second cable became the first successful transatlantic telegraph cable to become operational. Over the following 50 years or so, telegraph cables spread around the world and became the primary method of transmitting information quickly. The United Kingdom became a world leader in undersea cables because of the need to be connected to the far-flung places of the British Empire, and the British understood just how important they would be in times of crisis or war. So, the day after the outbreak of World War I, the British became the first nation to intentionally cut another nation's undersea telegraph cables when they cut five German cables in the English Channel that linked Germany with Spain, France, the Azores, and more indirectly, the rest of the world, all with the British cable laying ship HTMS Alert. This forced the Germans to use their powerful radio transmitter at Neuen to communicate outside of Europe, which was easier for the British to monitor. Something else the British intelligence services did was to quickly place sensors, basically people who would monitor every message that went through the more than 180 British-controlled telegraph stations around the world. This was the first systematic telegraph surveillance system and allowed them to not only stop German messages from getting through to their agents in the field, wherever they were, but also to eavesdrop on the 50,000 messages that would pass through the UK telegraph offices per day. By the end of the war, more than 80 million messages had been intercepted. Now, in the past, messages would have been written in pen, making it the perfect moment to showcase the impressive hover pen from Novium. Novium creates unique, innovative, high-end products to inspire curiosity and develop creativity. The hover pen uses powerful neodymium magnets to create a magnetic field to balance the pen against gravity and tilt it at 23.5 degrees, the same amount as the Earth on its axis and received the award for one of the best inventions of 2022 by Time magazine. This high-end writing pen is made from aircraft-grade aluminium and oozes technical sophistication, which is what you might expect from a company co-founded by a physicist, and is much a piece of installation art as it is a writing tool, and the super smooth and accurate rollerball makes writing a breeze. Available in Space Black, Starlight Silver, Mars Magma, and Neptune Blue, the hover pen makes an original and timeless gift idea not only for loved ones, but also as a treat for yourself too. There are also premium editions with an 18 karat gold nib as well as a shard of real meteorite embedded in the body. The hover pen also comes equipped with replaceable Schmidt cartridges, the German engineered luxury standard in ballpoint pens. The future edition combines a two in one fountain and rollerball pen with an interchangeable tip and premium version also comes with an 18 karat gold nib. 
Order your hover pen today and get not only free shipping, but also 10% discount by using the code CuriousDroid at the links in the description below. And you too can have this unique piece to adorn your desk at work or at home. Now, once you have the ability to see what people and governments are saying to each other in what would be private telegrams, that's something you don't give up. And it increased with both the British and then the US monitoring and tapping undersea cables over the following decades. During the Cold War, the American CIA and NSA were interested in finding out more about the Soviet submarines and the ICBM technology and their nuclear first strike capability. They became aware of a Soviet undersea telecommunications cable in the Sea of Otosk off the Western Pacific coast, which connected Petropavlovsk, the Soviet Pacific Fleet's primary nuclear submarine base, on the Kamchatska Peninsula to the Soviet Pacific Fleet's mainland headquarters in Vladivostok. In a highly classified operation called Ivy Bells in 1971, the US sent a modified submarine deep into Soviet waters which were strictly off limits to foreign ships, to place a highly sophisticated listening and recording device that measured about two meters in length and wrapped around the undersea cable. If a cable were raised, it was designed to detach itself to avoid being discovered. This could record the very slight electromagnetic field around the cable, and as such, the telephone signals that were passing through it. In fact, the Soviets were so sure of its security that many of the military conversations were sent unencrypted. Every month, for nearly 10 years, US Navy divers slipped past the Soviet listening devices to recover and replace the tapes containing the recorded data, and these were sent back to the NSA for analysis. With this, they could eavesdrop on senior Soviet officers' conversations to provide invaluable information on the Soviet Pacific nuclear submarine fleet. In fact, it was so successful that more advanced versions were built by AT&T, which used radioisotope thermoelectric generators, similar to those used on spacecraft like the Voyager probes, and could store a year's worth of data, and these were attached to other Soviet undersea cables. The Soviets only found out about these listening devices when NSA employee Ronald Pelton who was fluent in Russian and had gone bankrupt with financial problems, sold the details of the program to the Soviets. And the US only found out about the data leak when the KGB colonel, who was Pelton's initial contact in Washington, defected to the West. Since their invention in the 1970s, fiber optics have revolutionized telecommunications. And where one satellite with a go-to method of sending signals around the world, now fiber optic cables move thousands of petabytes of data far more cheaply and reliably than any satellite network like Skylink ever could. With this massive increase in data, the tapping of which is now on a scale that far outstrips the ability to analyze it, and the wiretapping of undersea cables spanning the globe has continued in secret by both the US and even more so by GCHQ in the UK. When the NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden leaked thousands of classified documents, it revealed a British program run by GCHQ called Tempora. Even back in the 2010s, it was sucking up 21 petabytes, that's 21 million gigabytes of data per day, which it stored for one month, in which time it was analyzed, looking for some 40,000 triggers that would be of interest and could be followed up on. This was basically capturing huge haystacks of data to find the needles of interest. However, if the police or intelligence services need to tap a person's phone, they need a warrant. Here, the data is taken wholesale. The excuse being used is that the government is doing this massive data trawling to protect national security, and that the new way of doing things isn't really the same as a single wiretap. Hence, the law needs to be looked at again. GCHQ also has more leeway than the NSA in the gathering process. In fact, the results are shared with the NSA. Of course, the other takeaway from the Snowden leaks was if our governments were taking these huge amounts of data over a decade ago, what are they doing now? And what about the foreign powers that are equally adept at cyber espionage such as China and Russia, especially as international relations are at an all-time low? All of which 
gives our governments the excuse to do it even more so. But how do they tap into an armoured undersea cable that uses fibre optic to transfer data at the bottom of the sea? Well, the easiest way is not to do it in the sea at all, but on the land where the cables come ashore and in agreement with the cable companies here in the UK and to a lesser extent in France, where they are ideally placed at the far western edge of Europe where most of the cables terminate. This is a highly secretive process in which it's thought that the cables are tapped by optical probes which bounce the light through a prism, make a copy of it and turn it into binary data without disrupting the flow of the original internet traffic. Glimmerglass, a global provider of optical cyber solutions, have said that they can offer their services to the intelligence community and offer the ability to monitor everything from Gmail to Facebook but it's not known if they were used as part of a British tempora or the US equivalent in data gathering. Tapping cables on the seabed itself is much more difficult, but it's believed that this involves tapping the regeneration nodes where the optical fibers terminate and the signals are boosted electronically before being sent on to the next stage of the fiber optic cable undersea. Devices similar to the 1970s Ivy Bell sensors could, in theory, pick up the stray electromagnetic energy from where the fiber optics are unbundled and individually boosted. This could be recorded and then picked up later in a similar way to what the US Navy did. There is also the possibility, although it's a very small one, that back doors could be secretly built into the cable in the manufacturing process that would allow data to be tapped and recorded. But what about the ultimate kill switch, the cutting of a cable like that was done in World War I? Well, it might work if there was only one cable connecting to a small country or a remote region. But now there are more than 400 active cables worldwide covering some 1.3 million kilometers, or about 780,000 miles. And many of these are multiple cables running between the same places, like the ones running across the Atlantic. The automatic switching and routing built into the backbone of the internet means that if one were cut, the data will be automatically rerouted through the other cables or through an alternative route. You would have to cut them all to have a complete loss of transmission. The UK is due to have a new multi-role ocean surveillance ship or MROS in 2024 to monitor and protect cables. It will also be fitted with advanced sensors and carry a number of remotely operated and autonomous undersea drones to inspect the cables and keep a lookout for attempts to interfere with them. Of course, when it comes to power cables between large wind farms and the onshore connection, it wouldn't be possible to reroute the electricity without a backup cable, which for economic reasons is often not done. Damage to all types of cables is far more likely to happen close to where they come ashore where they will be exposed to things like seabed trawling or accidental ship anchors. There's also the possibility of damage from submarine landslides and earthquakes, but a lot of planning goes into the routing of these cables to try and avoid areas where this is common. So on the whole, the undersea fiber optic networks, which are still expanding, are very resilient. And with its built-in redundancy, like the rest of the internet, it would be very difficult to knock out even a part of it. But as for the security, that can't be said to be the same if it's intentionally hacked by the people who own and control it. And that is a political, not a technological issue. So I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, then don't forget to thumbs up, share and subscribe. And remember your 10% discount and free shipping if you order your hover pen today.